Welcome to Learning Impact On Demand 2020 from IMS, Solutions for Highly Effective Digital Teaching and Learning in Response to the Accelerated Move to Remote Education. At IMS, we believe in the power of dynamic collaboration as a catalyst for digital innovation and transformation in education. And in this spirit, we are bringing together leaders in our community, representing top learning institutions and educational technology suppliers, to share knowledge and ideas for reimagining the educational experience and exploring new opportunities for shaping the future of teaching and learning. Today's topic is using engagement metrics to prioritize academic intervention in an online learning environment. And today's presenter is Andrew Miller, a principal education consultant with Blackboard. Uh, Andrew, this is clearly a topic um, that has not only been a perennial topic, uh, how to understand engagement, um, at institutions, but is one that is particularly top of mind in light of all of the changes going on right now in terms of learning delivery. So really looking forward to this and looking forward to seeing what you can share. So with that, take it away. Great, thanks so much. Yeah, so there are three fundamental elements to lasting change on campus. Uh, in their book, switch, how to teach change when change is hard. Uh, Chip and Dan Heath uh, use these three elements where they talk about directing the rider, motivating the elephant, and shaping the path. Um, what we've seen from the past four months or so, um, you know, the, the transition to fully remote delivery uh, and an increase in online learning has served as that motivation um, to, to help people pivot uh, especially higher ed, which um, you know it can sometimes you know change can be slow, it can be difficult. Um, but we saw people go from fully face to face to fully remote delivery over a weekend, over the course of a week, even. Um, and so for me, this is is it's so critical uh, to capitalize on this motivation. And we see that uh, senior administrators, um, faculty, deans, um, even student success professionals are all looking to data to make these, uh, to make their decisions, which is exciting for me personally, but I think for the profession as well, um, recognizing how much data we have exposure to through um, your learning management systems, um, through your student information systems, all sorts of platforms across campus uh, do analytics. And so you have data at your disposal. And so I've been encouraged to see people who want to use these data. Um, th this poll from Educaz uh, notes that, um, you know, approximately two thirds of the respondents, um, this, this poll was taken back in April, two thirds of those respondents reported at least a moderate and as high as a large increase in the demand for student analytic data. Um, and 78% of those uh, respondents were looking for information specifically uh, pertaining to academic interventions, and two-thirds of them were looking at data specific to the LMS. So as you mentioned before, I mean, this is incredibly timely. These are questions, um, heck, they've, they've plagued higher ed for you know, almost the past 400 years of, of education, looking at when to intervene, what students need assistance, and, and when and how can we provide that assistance. So these questions aren't new, but the, the environment where the questions are manifesting has seen a lot of, lot of change now that we're in this online environment. Um, and so, you know, in prior to this, um, people in face-to-face in -face courses have always been aided by the fact that they can see their students. I myself am uh, very much an extrovert, and so, uh, doing doing webinars, doing things on the computer can be challenging for me because I can't see my audience. I can't see which parts are, are really um, kind of driving that interest and the engagement. And also, you know, conversely, knowing um, maybe when I'm droning on a little bit too much. And so, for instructors in that same um, in, in that same vein, being able to see those confused looks can help them understand, maybe I need to pivot my approach, maybe I need to elaborate on this a bit more. Um, or when they see those, those looks of excitement and seeing a student really engaged in, um, in the content to take that a step further and to pivot in the moment and continue to, to provide um, additional insight and conversation on these topics. As, as Druger mentions, um, in this article that being there 
Uh, being in class is the essence of teaching and learning because it's in those moments uh, that those that unscripted, unforeseen experiences um, lead to that additional insight and that that novel insight where people make connections. And so, how do we how do we circumvent that, knowing that? 93% of communication is nonverbal. And a lot of what we're doing online, we collectively uh, offering online is asynchronous. Um, there's a huge gap there. But what I've always uh, enjoyed and what I've found very valuable is the fact that data, in a lot of ways, puts us in a better position to understand student behavior than we could even pick up or, or truly characterize uh, in a face to face setting. And so the approach today, uh, much like Chip and Dan Heath, Matt Abrahams uh, is a, a um, one of the leaders in, in, in public communication. And he provides this framework uh, that aligns with uh, the Heath brothers. And also, um, I, I like to use when, when we're talking about how do you communicate with data. And those three elements are what, so what, now what. Where the what are your data. It's the information that you have to present. The so what is this explanation of why those data are critical uh, so that you can motivate the elephant. Um, and then the now what, what is it that you need people to do with the information that they have that they're now motivated to act upon to explicitly list out some of those next steps. So not only am I going to uh, provide this through today, uh, through, through the, the webinar today, um, but also hope that you take this away as um, a fundamental component of how you tell the story of your data, how you share information and use your LMS data um, to drive action, whether it's from students, from faculty and colleagues, um, or student success personnel, following the what, so what, now what method uh, can be incredibly, incredibly helpful. Uh, so the what, where do we even begin? Uh, let's start with accesses. This is the first of three critical elements in online engagement. And accesses, when I refer to accesses, we're, we're referring to the frequency of opening a course. When you click on that link and it opens up the course shell. Um, and so this is important because you start to understand when and how often students are accessing their course, or conversely, when, when faculty are um, accessing their courses. We record this as a max of, of one per user per course per session. And, and let me explain that a little bit. If we were to think of a face-to-face -face course, right? Um, if I walk into the course and I sit down, I get marked as attending. Now, five or 10 minutes in, I need to go use the restroom or I left something in my car or in my, in my uh, residence hall. I need to go grab that paper and bring it back. But we wouldn't count me as attending a second time for that same session. And so in, in the same respect, we see this in the context of course accesses. And so when a student logs into, um, into the LMS and they access their course, even if they were to go into a different course and then come back, we're still counting that as one access. And so you get this very clear picture, again, of the, the frequency um, on a day-by-day -day basis or, or session-by-session -session basis for how often somebody is accessing their course. And what we notice is that accesses by themselves um, are relatively insufficient for characterizing engagement. The federal government even, even notes that um, insofar that uh, for online courses, um, being able to calculate uh, a student's last date of attendance for the return of Title IV funds, um, that they characterize accessing a course, logging into an online class without active participation does not count as attendance. Um, and so we see that there is at least one more step and I'll show you there's actually at least two more uh, that, that go into characterizing engagement and attendance in an online environment. And so the second critical one are the minutes that somebody is spending in the class. You, you open a class and now you're going to spend a substantial amount of time um, navigating the, the course content. Uh, we, we see this again in a parallel to face-to-face -face courses. Um, students are docked for showing up late. Um, and so there is clearly something um, 
important about the time that you're spending in the class that leads to engagement. And whether that's watching video lectures, it's reading course content, participating in discussion boards or taking exams, all of this takes time and you can see a, a correlation um, or oftentimes you can see a correlation between the amount of time somebody is spending and the level of success that they have. Um, but the question I always get when, when, when we're training faculty is, okay, great, Andy, but what happens when a student clicks on a class, they, they open the course, it starts timing, and they walk away. We have no basis to understand what is actually happening. And yes, that's certainly true, but that's where this third leg of this, of this chair comes in, and those are interactions. And interactions are what we characterize as the meaningfulness of clicks on course content. Um, being able to understand what they click, uh, but it's not just mindlessly clicking. It is clicking um, on links. It's opening folders. It are these meaningful clicks uh, that load content. Um, so again, you, you open a folder and you navigate through the, the different content. Each of those clicks that either opens a folder, opens a link uh, within the context of, of our course, provide that meaningfulness. Um, and are, are what we characterize as interactions. And so you see that all three of these at a fundamental level are, are codependent upon each other. Um, you know, I, I guess we'll go to a couple of extremes. Let's use that last one that that faculty discussed where I open a course and I walk away. We've got high minutes and you know, maybe I do that every single day. So I have, I have, you know, seven days, I have seven course accesses and maybe that totals a couple hundred minutes. Well, I would not characterize that student as engaged because we have no understanding of what else they've actually done in the course. But conversely, if I show up and, and I, you know, as for whatever reason, some very wise student understands how interactions are being, uh, being tracked, I could show up on a Saturday evening and I'll just open a bunch of content. I'll open and close a folder and I'll open another one. I'll just click around. Now I have one access, maybe I'm only in for five or six minutes, but I have 45 interactions. Again, without the minutes, those other two are relatively insufficient. And I would also argue, lastly, that if we ignore the importance of accesses, you know, binging on course content is not a recipe for success. And so if I come in and even if I'm spending a couple hours in a course, but I only have one access a week, to me, that would throw up a red flag of a student who is not entirely engaged, or maybe they are engaged, but there's some other factors that still suggest risk. So again, it's our accesses, the frequency that we're opening a course, the time we're spending in the course, characterized by minutes, and then our interactions, the, uh, the meaningful clicks um, that, that demonstrate our engagement with course content. So we see this not only at the, at the course level, <clears throat> But if we break it down further, being able to look at this at a more granular level and understanding accesses, minutes, and interactions in the context of individual course content, understanding what items students are opening and, and what items are driving high engagement. Similarly, how much time are they spending in these courses uh, or in, in these content? Is a student you know, who has uh, maybe a, a quiz that has 10 multiple choice questions, is it taking them 45 or 50 minutes to complete that exam? To me, that would lead to questions about, um, you know, how that student is taking the exam. Um, are there, you know, and, and I guess each of these examples are gonna be uh, very nuanced to how you deliver your course. Uh, but these are the sorts of uh, feedback that you can receive that you would otherwise need um, need to see face to face. You can see that student who is only on the second question as all of their peers have already completed an in-person exam. So we can see this through minutes. Um, you know, and, and I guess even going further with the minutes, being able to, you know, say I have a, a recorded lecture, maybe I have some commentary on, uh, on, on a particular chapter that took 25 to 30 minutes to record but students are only watching the first seven minutes of this. What does that tell me about my instruction? What does it uh, help inform me for how I'm delivering content? Maybe I break these up into smaller, smaller segments on individual topics, or um, I guess I'm feeling frisky and wanna be a little more punitive. How do I characterize what's been taught in the second half of that lecture and 
carry that over to see if maybe they're gaining that information um, from a different venue, but how that manifests on exams and, and assessments or whatnot. So again, being able to see interactions, accesses, and minutes, not only at a course level, but that individual content level can be incredibly helpful. And when you think of stakeholders, this isn't just for faculty. Certainly they can use it to understand the design of their course. Um, they can uh, use it to um, understand and, and maybe see which students they need to prioritize their outreach for. But it also provides them that formative feedback um, uh, on a, a week by week, heck, even a day by day basis, being able to see the design of their course, the instruction that they're delivering, and how students are engaging with their content. My background is in academic and career advising. Uh, and so for me, this is where I've always loved um, having the data. So much of, of what we do in advising are looking at student characteristics, and understandably so. Um, but student characteristics, Aren't all you can't? There's no practical way to change a student's first generation status. Um, you know, other student characteristics uh, that that may or may not be risk factors that are not altogether malleable. But things that are malleable are behavior, and so not we can see these benchmarks in the aggregate, looking at at course level metrics to see in this particular course, all of these students are spending 60 minutes a week on a course. Well, Andy over here is only spending 25 minutes. What's going on with Andy? How can I intervene with him? Or if we're looking on a week by week basis, being able to track the trend, not only for um, alerts to mental health concerns, if the student has a sudden drop off in their behavior, not just in a class, but across all their courses, that can lead, uh, can, you know, can be a huge indicator of um, depression, other mental health issues that really, um, provide the impetus for immediate intervention. Um, and then lastly, as we intervene with students, we can track, again, on this week-by-week -week basis, being able to see the change that they make and how that corresponds with their grade. Um, not only provides the affirmation that students may need to continue to refine behavior, um, you know, but, but helps validate uh, and give us feedback on the approaches that we're taking to improve um, student behavior for their success. Uh, and as we take a step back and we think from the, the eyes of an uh, instructional designer or a senior administrator, understanding best practices, setting up some of those guiding frameworks, um, not only what the, the research shows, because that's important and, and everything we ought to do should be research-based, but to look specifically on your campus and understand which faculty are really driving high engagement. How can they help contribute to developing their peers? I uh, find so much of uh, this type of change, if it can be done in an organic manner, that, that faculty are teaching faculty, how, how much more receptive they can be to um, seeing what works as opposed to perhaps a, a decree from on high or um, some well-intentioned uh, academic advisor providing suggestions. That when you have data to provide this sort of information, faculty are, are often um, very grateful and excited to be able to understand um, how they can adjust the delivery of their course to drive engagement. Um, and then lastly is this resource deployment. And you know, so when, when everybody made this pivot, faculty, staff, people were at different levels of their technological capacity um, and capabilities. So how do you um, how do you prioritize or understand who may need additional assistance, who's got this under control? All of this we can show empirically through the data that we've just discussed. And so for me, that's the excitement, that's the potential of analytics in an educational context and the different people who can benefit from it. Uh, so here are some examples of different reports uh, that, that we've, I've, I've actually built a lot of these side by side with uh, some of the schools we've worked with and um, took a snapshot of some of uh, these certainly de-identified, but to provide some really interesting and compelling graphics for how you communicate with these data to drive action, whether that's intervention uh, and outreach from faculty um, or advisors, or how you can make adjustments to uh, resource deployment and course design. 
So this first one, this is uh, a scatter plot where on the x-axis, we're looking at activity. And in this case, just based on the filter, you can see uh, it says interaction. So we're looking at the number of interactions that students have in a particular course and how that corresponds on the y-axis with their LMS grade. And what we see, um, encouragingly so, is a general positive relationship. Um, but you do see a lot of students, especially those in, I don't know if that's green or gray, but those on the bottom who are below this trend line, those are the ones who are gonna need that outreach, especially those who are spending a lot of time in the course. Perhaps they're spending more time because the content is more challenging for them. But they're people who are showing that they're invested. And much like this report here, um, you have uh, an ability to see which students are engaged, which ones are not engaged. You have the ability to see which ones are doing well and which ones are not. And so you can prioritize um, your outreach again, either as a faculty member or as an advisor. Um, and certainly all of our students need that love and attention. Uh, on this one here, we're looking at, uh, we have a, a grid that, that color codes students on a week by week basis based on their grade. So which is the, on the Y axis here and their activity on the X. And so you have in the bottom left hand corner or quadrant, you have your students who are inactive. So they have low activity and they have a low grade. Uh, diagonal from that, you have your students with a high activity and the higher grade they certainly wanna provide um, affirmation to those students. But then we have these other two that the top left quadrant are those who are inactive, uh, but have somehow managed a higher grade. To me, that leads to a lot of good follow-up questions about how are they learning or what am I doing in my course um, that I may need to revisit in terms of, of rigor or maybe, again, it's affirming some of the non-online um, content that I've provided. Maybe they're spending more time uh, downloading materials. They print them off and they want to read and highlight their notes that way. Um, but then this group here in this um, eggplant color, I suppose you, you could call it, um, that the active students with lower grades. To me, those are the first students you want to reach out to. Those are the students who are invested in your course. They're committed to doing well, but for whatever reason, something's not working. Either it's, um, you know, the content is really challenging. Maybe their study skills aren't great, but this gives us a great um, understanding of who we can and should be reaching out to, um, to help give them just that little bit of a nudge that they need to move into the, the higher grades. And so you may be asking, you know, Andy, how do we know <clears throat> what's a high grade, what's a low grade, what's good activity and poor activity? Because uh, certainly um, you'll see some courses, uh, maybe in, in some of your trades, and actually this is a, a, an assumption, but uh, that have been proven wrong on before, but you know, some, some courses just simply aren't <clears throat> meant to be taught online. Uh, a lot of those with the very tactile, hands-on, <clears throat> learning uh, like an arborist class at a technical college may not be a whole lot that you can offer online. Uh, but then again, I've found examples where you can. Um, but conversely, there may be other classes that really need a, a ton of activity online. And so what we've done is we've broken these into deciles. And that decile is based upon the individual course. So it's taken all of the students in the class and put the, whether that is 10 students or 200 students and place them into one of 10 buckets. And each of those buckets is based on the amount of activity. So you're gonna have your, your top 10% of students in the first decile and your 10% your of students with the lowest amount of activity in the 10th decile. And so it's the intersection of these two that provides this heat map. So a really compelling way to identify you know what, maybe I need to reach out to the, the bright reds, or maybe it's these, you know, that, that, that plum color that I need to reach out to initially. Again, using visualizations to drive action because as people start to understand what activity means and, and what this means in the context of their course. Um, here's an interesting one. So the, the BI tool, uh, I've fallen in love with the, the Sankey chart, which is what this is. Had never seen it before, uh, but found a really cool use case where we were looking at uh, the time of day for when students are uh, logging into a course. And actually in the yellow, it's a little bit tougher to see, but are, are when instructors are logging into the course. And so we see on the left-hand side, the day of the week, and on the right-hand side, we have it clustered uh, by, by the time of day band. And so you know, your morning is from, uh, I believe, seven o'clock to 
10 or 11 a.m. And then your afternoon is at 11 or noon until um, middle of the afternoon and your evening and off hours. And what we see, um, contrary to what I, well, contrary to what my <laughs> poor academic behavior was, uh, we see a lot of students who are in on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday mornings um, spending the, the vast majority of their time. Um, you don't see as many people cramming stuff in on a Sunday evening. Um, certainly don't see a lot of activity on Friday evenings either uh, or, or Saturdays. Uh, but so, you know, this can, can really lead not only for IT to understand when they need to offer IT support, but what about faculty on when they should make themselves available for office hours um, or, or tutoring? When do you need to offer tutoring? So when you can break this down and look specifically at your chemistry courses and say, you know what, I need to have a math tutor here because of the, uh, the importance of algebra and the types of questions we used to get from walk-in appointments. Now I can make my tutor available um, or I can offer my time during these, these time of days uh, understanding what student behavior looks like. So again, for resource deployment um, across the, the spectrum of, of campus stakeholders, uh, to me is, is some really um, encouraging data and presented in kind of a, in a neat way, I thought. Uh, here, so we've seen uh, some, uh, some schools are actually looking um, even back, just assessing you know, kind of everything that happened um, in, in the spring semester, understanding activity. And so this one was taken from a school uh, who wanted to see on a, a day by day, week by week basis, what those activity trends looked like for faculty and for students. And what we notice um, here with interactions, this day 60, you know, if, if you break that out, that'd be about week um, eight or nine, somewhere in there, which puts them right around mid-March. And you see this tremendous increase. Um, I actually have the icon wrong, I think, but here instructors, you know, with over 33 accesses compared to before where they're only at 20, you're seeing this, this tremendous jump in the matter of a day or two uh, because these, these faculty are now offering face-to-face -face courses online and what that means for them, not just instruction time, but in course development time. Um, and so you really, really get an interesting uh, sense of how this impacted faculty, how this impacted students. Um, you know, and so being able to assess that in the context of, of all the different questions people are asking when, when we look back on, on the spring 2020 semester and we look at March and April and, and what that means for, for course usage. Um, here are a few others, uh, ones that we found exciting. Uh, actually, I'll start with the bottom one, just a breakdown of um, course content, whether that's assessments, contents, tools, discussions, um, being able to see the um, amount and the, the different uh, distribution of, of content types that people are using in their courses. Um, and you know, having the ability to um, separate each of these out, if perhaps this is department by department, instructor by instructor, um, being able to get a baseline and, and understand uh, what tools are worth uh, continuing to invest in, which ones may not be having or may not be utilized as often as, as you expected or, or really need them to for uh, uh, to, to, to merit the investment in those. Um, but along the lines of adoption is being able to measure your progress. And so we've built some KPIs, some key performance indicators that measure progress against goal on any particular day. And so when, when a, a, um, a dean, your CIO, or someone else could open this up and notice, you know, that that today we're sitting 16% higher uh, on the use of assessments than we were a year ago. Well, that's really good. And this one, as it su suggests, with being in the green area and the, the speedometer on the far right, that that things are tracking very well. Uh, whereas perhaps for for this school or for this instructor or department, um, we actually see a little bit of a drop in their use of assessments. I want to clarify it and make sure that it's it's um, yeah, but very clear that these data themselves do not provide you the answer in and of itself. This provides you evidence um, that often leads to 
additional questions. And if we're doing analytics, right, you are, we always will have those additional questions. You know, what's the context? Is there a, an explanation for why there's a drop off here? Is it contextual to the course? Maybe the instructor said, hey, I recognize everyone is um, to online assessments. And so I always want to make sure that people understand the intent of analytics is that it's not meant to pigeonhole or just provide um, a fact of what is, and this is the concrete, you know, things that are dichotomous, good or bad. It's often providing evidence to lead to a conversation and enhance communication. Um, and actually we see this communication continue to manifest in what we call our at-a-glance reports, which takes a lot of what we have before and we package them together in, in a meaningful way. And so this one is looking at uh, a, a, a demo student, John Aiken, this is taken from our demo environment, um, but looking at John's weekly accesses and how that trends. So John is, is here in the purple uh, where his peers are in black. And so again, we're comparing apples to apples um, understanding that the true context of the course, and we can see how John is doing in relation to his peers. Uh, instructors are able to look at their courses um, and see, you know, this, this instructor specifically has 154 assessments in the course compared to the department average of 123, and actually tends to be above average in, in all of the content being offered, um, but happens to not have any students accessing these tools and so you know what what are some strategies for increasing tool usage among your students all of these data again come back to interactions accesses and minutes in comparison to each other leads to some really great uh really great communication um actually this one's just a blow blown up version of, of what we saw before but again comparing it um to the, the course averages. And so the, the reason that this is important, having these data, we talk about the what, so what, now what, um, in the context of early alerts, um, and I would argue the same, uh, these findings here, the same will apply to faculty, um, is that early alerts enhance communication between faculty, between advisors and students. And so when these three forces come together, that's when we see student success really, um, move in, 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 the, in the right direction. Uh, and this study from Hudson 2005 looked at um, academic advisors who reached out, they were informed of students having excessive absences. Just that one data point, absences in a face-to-face -face course, led to a conversation that helped students, it facilitated their re-entry to class. A lot of them were afraid of going back to class because they had missed before and they didn't want to be stigmatized as a student who was ditching class. Um, and, and similarly, it builds that um, sense of community when, when those students um, expressed that they were surprised to know that somebody actually cared enough to reach out to them. Um, and so we, we think of, of um, but in risk factors generally that you know, we talk about first generation students. We talk about um, the technology changes for online students. But when we put those together, how many of your students are first generation online, even if they're not first generation in college, but the first generation to be taking some, most, or all of their courses online, a lot of them have not been raised in an environment that they know how to learn in an online environment. And so simply providing this feedback, letting them know what their behavior is and what their behavior ought to be for the type of success that they want, provides them the data to make an informed decision. So making data informed decisions at the lowest level possible, impacting students um, because you can help change behavior. Again, we're certainly giving them the choice and we're not throwing out policies that um, limit students' self sense of, of control, uh, but provide them the information to make informed decisions. Uh, and the same would be, the, would be true for faculty, um, that you can um, find a nice balance between academic freedoms and best practices by understanding that here's the information to make an informed decision for how you deliver your course um, and how can we help provide the, the resources necessary to exemplify those best practices? All right, so we've talked about the what and the the, the so what. Now it comes to the now what. Um, and it, one of my favorite books is called Procrastinate on Purpose. And Rory Vaden, the, the author here, um, 
ask the question, what can you do today that will give you more time tomorrow? And I recognize in all that's been happening, nobody wants just one more thing to do. Uh, but as my own personal testimony from my time in advising, the little bit of time I would spend in analytics yielded considerable time down the road. Because for me, it was difficult to get the data I needed to take the appropriate action. I would either have to uh, wait for someone else to provide it to me, or I'd take a long time to merge and clean these data and get it usable. Well, using analytics tools um, can give you the data that you need on demand. Um, and so what I'd like people to do, if you are serious and if you're excited about the potential of analytics, is take a step back and just think about the questions that you're asking right now, that data, um, could help inform your, your action upon. And so to write down a list of the questions, just this entire week, what, what questions do you have to begin with? Who, you know, who hasn't logged in in the past week? Um, you know, who uh, or which faculty are, are um, exemplifying that they have, are driving high engagement? Or you can ask how many questions, how many students haven't logged in in the past week? How many students submitted their work early? When you have a list of these questions, now think about which ones are difficult to acquire, uh, the data that you may not have access to right now, um, or if you do have access, as I mentioned before, are very difficult to, to gather. And so you get this list um, and just think for a moment about what you could do if you were able to get this information on demand, that you were able to open up a dashboard and it provided you the information that you needed so that you can take the action immediately. And now we're spending our time not scrubbing data, but interacting with students. Uh, for me, having that, that immediate impact on course design, on student success, that's what we're here to do. And for me, that's the, the true potential there. And so as you, you have this list of questions, you may talk to your IT staff, um, your registrar, institutional research, um, and you're going to hear some terms out there. And so I just want to take the last minute or two here to talk about some, some key terms you may hear. One is a data warehouse. And the other is a data lake. And although there's some similarities between the two, uh, there, are, uh, there are also some very uh, specific differences between them. And so for me, if I'm going to use the analogy of, of your data being like um, groceries at a grocery store, right? Everything is organized in rows and aisles, and each department has their data organized in specific ways. It's not practical to cook in a grocery store. And so people go and they collect the data that they need. They collect the groceries they need to bring it back home and they organize it in a pantry. You organize your data in a data warehouse so that you can grab the data you need and cook up some cool reports. Um, and so your data warehouse is nice because it's organized. It, it's refined based on the data that you need. You've already got it um, transformed in a way that makes it very usable. These are complex, um, but there's a lot of potential there. And then the last, or the, the data lake is very similar, um, except for you're often working with ingredients that are more raw in nature. Things are still organized, uh, but you do have to go back each time and, and you cut up the data and you spend a little bit of time, but it gives you additional flexibility. Um, you know, in, in, in certain instances, your data lake can have a broader array of, of data um, because it's not going to be specific to a, an individual platform. Um, actually, I think one of the challenges with everybody doing analytics, and I'm not talking, uh, it, like everybody has reports, they have data that they're calling analytics. And so for us, it's really important to be able to bring these together and understand how usage of your video tool and your LMS come together. Being able to have that in a data lake can be really, really important. Um, and the last comment, this is really my own personal, um, I don't know if you want to call it a plug, but just if we're going to do data, we have to do it right. Um, analytics really is a lifestyle change and a very good one. Um, but when we see, I'm going to do analytics, I'm just going to get this one report, we're not going to see substantial change or even an impact on student success in those little, little tiny silos. You need to be able to commit to making some changes in behavior, to invest just a little bit of time each week to ask those questions in a meaningful way, to understand where those data are coming from, what they tell you, and then being able to communicate accordingly. Um, and so that's the path that we need to shape, not just individually, but across campus. 
Uh, and so one last time with this, this shameless analogy, if you need an in-house nutritionist or an in-house chef, I'd be happy to work with you, provide some guidance on how you can mold your data to lead to actionable change. Um, and so with that, I, I will conclude and just want to say thank you, Carrie, and, and to IMS Global for your time today. It sounds like there may be a, a few few questions. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on a, on a couple of things that you, you mentioned throughout, um, just to sort of help folks synthesize all the really, really great information you just presented. I, like you, I'm a big believer in the promise of analytics. We know this has been some, something that uh, higher education has been trying to address, struggling with for, gosh, 10, 15 years now. Yeah. feels like we're starting to see some real uh, traction, some real forward movement, and some new pressures that have contributed to that. Thinking about engagement analytics, as you've been talking about here, do you see any sort of new trends emerging in the field of engagement analytics or even analytics in general? And, and, um, and has that conversation begun to change at all in the context of you know, all of the, um, the pivot uh, to fully yeah. online learning and, and hybridized online learning? Tenants, being able to not just kind of calculate on a spreadsheet what it costs to deliver a course, but be able to look at, at courses specifically down to um, the dollar amount for, you know, how much does it cost to offer um, a computer science course versus a, a general education an English course or something. And the promise that that shows for um, being able to understand maximizing the, um, the, the student to teacher ratio, uh, to me, that's a really promising uh, practice I've seen some people move towards. And uh, the coronavirus, everything that we're going through now, it, you know, see people looking at contact tracing or, or people looking, actually, this is a really cool one. Um, uh, uh, partner institution we're working with uh, was looking at the number of accesses, mobile accesses versus non-mobile accesses for how they were going to provision and prioritize um, laptop rentals. You know, and so being able to understand students, um, you know, and geographically uh, based on Wi-Fi. So seeing students' accessibility to, to technology, uh, to me, that's probably the most exciting one because it's trying to give students what they need to be successful. I could go on and on though. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, then ultimately that can touch on topics about equitable access and, and yeah. other things that are, you know, again, really coming to the fore as part of this. And I know that the conversation about engagement often often leads down that road. And as you say, that's a conversation that could go for a whole nother hour. <laughs> sure. um, but thinking about analytics on campus, um, you know, certainly there's there's different audiences for those analytics. There's, you know, then how data needs to be thought about or even presented to, for example, administrators versus versus faculty. Um, you know, some yeah. faculty, you know, anecdotally are are somewhat resistant to the idea of analytics because it feels it, it feels almost too sort of dry and calculated. As a big form. brother, this guy, I think you could yeah, say that exactly. Yeah. But, but obviously, you know, things like this are, can be very can contribute very much to, to faculty success. Are there different ways that institutions should think about how they approach data or the the presentation of data to these different audiences? Yeah, um, yeah. My, my hope is that that there is that 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 mutual trust between the two. Because yeah, I mean, certainly yes, that you could use data nefariously and, and use it in a punitive manner. But my hope is that, um, and, and where I've seen it exciting, especially uh, it, when faculty are, are um, more entrepreneurial, that, that they see, well, just like you mentioned, these are, like, now I have access to this information. I can see precisely when a student did or did not um, make a submission or interacted with the course, or I can see that they're spending all this time. Uh, for me, that's really where the, uh, the pitch comes in, how you present it to, to faculty is the promise of what they can do with the information that they have uh, for administrators being able to, um, well, yeah, I mean, e even then being able to make those informed decisions and, and just, for me, it's always important, even talking to faculty about how it's important to contextualize. Uh, I made that comment earlier about data not being the, the, end of the answer, but really just the catalyst to subsequent questions and a dialogue that is so very necessary. That's how I would approach it really with anyone, even with students. Um, you wouldn't come in, 
you know, throw out, Hey, Andy, you're a first generation student. Data says that you're going to struggle. Like to me, that would not be a, a, a great way to use data. I think that, you know, it comes in and say, Hey, so you're a first generation student. Um, tell me about, you know, what, what kind of led to your decision to come to campus, to come to this school specifically. And what are some, you know, so use it to prompt a conversation as to just provide an answer. Uh, it's a long winded way to answer, I suppose, but that's, I guess the approach I've taken and have seen success and, and have encouraged others to know that they've had success that way too. So to start the well, conversation there. Taking even one step further back, you know, there's there's obviously institutions out there that um, have a lot of experience with analytics, have very robust and sophisticated analytic solutions and analytic ecosystems on campus. Yeah. There's also a lot of institutions that maybe are just getting started or even aren't sure where to start. So you know, thinking especially about those institutions that are right at the beginning of this journey. Yeah. How do they start thinking about analytics? How do they start thinking about engagement analytics and, and kind of where both, you know, just as a, as a broader institutional ecosystem, where do they start? Yeah. Um, I would always encourage people to look and see what you have currently, even if, if you don't have an analytics platform uh, associated with your, your LMS, to look and see what data you can get, what reports you can get from any, any software you're using, um, or really anywhere from across campus. What are those questions that you have, and what are you able to answer right now, um, and what can't you answer right now? And the reason you want to do this is because it helps focus your thinking. There is so much out there in the world of analytics, so many things that, excuse me, that you can, that you can answer that you need to know where you want to begin. Um, and so for me, being able to understand that gap of, of what you know and what you want to know, um, because once you get something in analytics platform, it's going to open your eyes to things you didn't know you didn't know. Uh, and that's a really, it, for me, a very exciting time too. Like, wow, there's all this information out here. Um, but I guess the, the short answer would be to, to understand what you know and understand what you don't know, but you want to. Uh, because you know, when, when you work with a, a vendor and we, we come on campus and say, great, how do you want to use data? and we get a blank stare, uh, it's certainly no fault of, of the schools, but it makes it difficult to provide that, that tangible, uh, th those quick wins and really build that momentum because you can see that the promise of, of what you invested in. Andy, that was excellent. Thank you so much. There was a tremendous amount of information there, a lot to digest. Um, but really appreciate you taking the time and, and kind of helping institutions understand both you know what they may have now where they need to go and and how to move this conversation forward so we really appreciate you taking the time and sharing that with us yeah likewise and carrie thank you i uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today um it, it's been such a good resource for myself as a practitioner being able to uh the, the way that you share information so i'm grateful for the opportunity to contribute myself and look forward to future conversations <laughs>